One of the first principles we have to accept um, is that nature abhors a vacuum for the, for the most part. So when there's an empty space, nature's gonna wanna move in and fill it. And that's usually where we, you know, our backs will be up against the wall. We'll be saying weeds, 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 oh no. So let's fill those niches with things that we want and things that are going to combat the weed pressure. So plants are gonna fill niches in time. So that's past, present, and future time. Time. Um, ground layers, middle layers, architectural uh, in, in a month from now, in a year from now, in five years from now. So wherever there's a niche, plants are going to try to move in. So we have mutualism and exclusion, stress and compatibility, and these things define the, the success or not of a designed plant community within a garden. So mutualism, we can basically think of that as plants working together even though they're not necessarily cognizant of the fact that they're working together, but we can use natural plant tendencies um, so that it does appear that they're working together and creating this idea of stability and resilience in the landscape. And there's also exclusion. There are plants like aggressive species, which will make it very difficult for other more behaved species to establish. And sometimes, sometimes that can actually be a good thing that we can use, especially on larger landscapes or stressed landscapes. So we talk about niches in time. Let's go into that a little bit more because that will help us read uh, natural landscapes that we're finding when we walk in woodlands and then deserts and prairies and shrublands. Uh, and then, and then uh, as we're thinking about those landscapes, we can, we can consider how to translate some of those aspects into our home designs. So niches in time, there's, there's seasonality, right? Uh, that would be when does a plant bloom? How, how fast is it growing? How large does it get? Does that growth happen over one growing season? Um, does it happen over several years? And what is the final size going to be? There's an aspect of senescence too. That's when a plant starts to die back in late summer or fall or winter. And you're left with the, um, what I think are very gorgeous, beautiful, browned architectural forms, the bones of the plant. What does it look like? What are the ecosystem services it's providing when it has gone through senescence? And then of course, seed heads is part of that. What are the seed heads providing aesthetically and, and functionally um, as well as habitat in the winter? And with niches in time, we also have to think um, and just, just taking one growing season, right? Some plants are annuals, some are biennials, some are perennials. So in the first half of the summer, in spring and summer, your annuals are putting on their show, they're taking over, and then they start to die back and biennials will start to grow. And then over by the end of the season, and the next season, perennials, most of our herbaceous perennials will start to establish and um, really put up their foliage and flowers. And then of course, we have to think about structure when we think of niches in time, drifts, masses of plants as well as individual um, plant species spread around in the landscape. So there's all these wonderful niches that we can consider and, and use in our landscapes to create an aesthetically pleasing uh, garden bed. So here's an example of a seeded landscape. I think this was done probably in 2008-ish. Yeah, that seems about right. What's interesting about this landscape well, first, I think this is gorgeous. I hope you do too, but it's also a very simple landscape. It's a sloped, it's a slightly sloped hillside with a, a silty soil. It's sort of a sandy, lussy, clayey sort of, sort of mess, but it really it drains well. It's hot in the summer. So the plant competition is interesting. We basically have clumps of Cytothgrama, little blue stem grass in here as a matrix. And we have the Dahlia purpurea, purple prairie clover coming up with wonderful masses and drifts uh, among it. So this would be like, oh, I don't know, late June, early July in this landscape in, in Minnesota. So. I mean, there's a lot to, there, you know, wouldn't you like to have this in your front yard? I would. Here's actually a, another portion of that same landscape. And I'm really, I really want you to get this um, blaze and, and under your mind and into your eyeball because we have a lot going on here. We have a lot of wonderful things to learn about <coughs> and that we can copy. So you'll see, you have to excuse me. I, I appear to be dying today. <clears throat> So we have lots of clumps of little blue stem. 
It's not really taking over. Up in the upper left in that area, it does seem to be taking over a little bit, which is what little blue stem can do when there's not much competition. But we have sort of this balance going on here in, in, this, in this landscape image right here. Let's look at these plants a little bit more because I find this to be something that I, you know, I wish I could design in a, in a landscape. It just feels that well put together to me. All right, we're numbering our plants. So our little blue stems are threes. We have heath aster, which is two. Uh, we have the gray-headed coneflower, which is one. I think that's, those are all the species I wanted to identify here today with you. So little blue stem, that's going to take a year or two, maybe even three to fully establish from seed. Heath aster is a prolific self-seeder, so it's interesting that it really hasn't taken over this space. I think some of the, one of the reasons for that is because of the roots, fibrous root system of little blue stem. And there's really a lot of equilibrium here. And then that number one plant up there, the gray-headed coneflower, Retibita pinnata, that is an early succession, early colonizing herbaceous perennial. So at the first year or two at this landscape was seeded, I would imagine it, it was quite prominent, a, a lot more than it is here. Um, but we can see here that it's having, there are smaller spaces where it can self-sow and it's probably just self-sowing around mother plants. Still, it provides this interesting seed texture, um, interesting height, and it's, it's fitting these very small little holes in the landscape wherever there are, there, there are these tiny gaps. And here we go, Exp I explained those, I just explained those verbally, now you can have them explained to you in writing, so there you go. We're looking at this again because I actually went and, ca and, and counted the plants in this image. We had six gray head coneflowers, seven heath asters, and 15 little blue stems. And, and more than that too, we have seedlings in there. And then we have other species like the zizia, the goldenrod, uh, the rosa arkansas, and the dahlia are all in there. So all these plants are obviously adjusted to dry, uh, dry site. Um, that's why they're are doing well right here and this this sort of going out into nature and seeing that these plants are existing together and seem to be doing so in relative harmony you know can teach us all right i i have a space in my yard that i want to look like this these are probably species i should try in combination with one another so that's like the number one huge massive big lesson we can take when you're walking around outside um, in a park, a natural area, prairie woodland or whatever. Take stock of the species that are, are growing there, the arrangements. Um, what, are, what are the numbers? What, what, what niches are, are they filling in time, in layers? Um, and, and do you think you can maybe you know, try and, and copy that in your home landscape? So when we're learning from nature, we have a few goals. One of them is how to use a plant's natural tendencies to cultivate ecosystem and aesthetic function. Little blue stem, for example, fibrous roots um, can self-sow somewhat aggressively when the soil is totally open and bare. So it's wonderful for site stabilization, soil erosion control. And then how to use plant communities to reduce management and increase habitat diversity. That, that sort of goes along the same lines. If you have a large site and you just need that site covered ASAP and you, you don't want to have to mow it and mess with it a whole bunch, um, the plant communities that we just identified above in the image, man, they're going to be perfect for you. So in a home garden setting, we can certainly translate these goals, bring them down the scale a little bit, and then sort of up the ornamental ante a little bit. So in this bed, we have a, um, I think that's probably July or August on the left, probably August and on the right, we are looking at late September, early October. So we have stiff goldenrod there in the foreground, some purple coneflower. Um, the blue uh, blooming plant is aromatic aster, and we certainly have plenty of little blue stem in there, but it's not taking over. It's not even taking over in the lawn, which I find quite fascinating. I can't explain why. There just must not be enough open areas, gaps for the seed to get in there and, and germinate with sunlight and contact with the soil.